Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap, and buying a new TV can be pretty overwhelming. You've got to consider the size, uh, resolution, whether it's 1080p, 4K, even 8K. Then you've got OLED versus QLED, refresh rates, response time, sound quality, and then of course, to top it off, the price, your budget. That's probably the most important thing. So it can all get pretty stressful. So I'm going to try and break down the basics of what you need to know. But for starters, before we get into the nitty gritty, there's a few sort of top level recommendations I can give you. Firstly, and this might sound obvious, but buy what you need. Because you can easily spend a lot of money on a TV, but you may not need to. And these days you can get a lot of flagship features in relatively low cost TVs. At the same time though, also consider if you are spending a bit more on something like a good 4K TV, which is a little more future proof, then you won't need to upgrade again for even longer. Secondly, and TVs like, well, anything that's expensive can depreciate rapidly. It's not quite the same as taking a car off the lot, but if you consider new flagship TVs now that say cost two grand, in about nine months time, they'll probably cost 12 or 1300. So either buy last year's models or just wait until maybe Black Friday when you'll get some big discounts on even the latest TVs. And lastly, don't forget about extras like a soundbar or even a new TV stand. I mean, if your new TV has great picture quality but average or poor speakers, then you may want to factor in the cost of a soundbar. And also if it's a larger TV, say 65 inches and above, then make sure the base fits on your TV stand and there's still room for a soundbar if needed. But let's dive a little deeper and the first thing you need to consider when buying a TV is what size it should be. TVs are measured from corner to corner. There is actually an optimum screen size for a given distance, which is based on how much of your vision it fills and how the eye resolves detail. And there's also online calculators to help you work out yours. Or you could just forget all that and go with a massive TV in a tiny room for that ultimate immersive experience if you're enthusiast slash idiot like me. <laughs> <laughs> but importantly, size and distance are also related to the screen's resolution, or its number of pixels. Almost all new TVs are either 4K or Full HD 1080p, with 4K being the newer standard. 4K TVs have four times as many pixels, so it's like having four Full HD screens stuck together, meaning the TV can display a more detailed picture. The problem is, image quality is usually limited by what content you can actually watch. So just because you have a 4K TV doesn't mean everything you're watching is now suddenly in 4K. There is a lot more than there used to be when it first came out a few years ago. Uh, and Netflix and Amazon, YouTube, BBC iPlayer, most of the big streaming services now do offer 4K. And of course also HDR content, which we'll come to in a second. But not everything does. And you know, older Blu-rays, so non-Ultra HD Blu-rays, uh, and you know, just older content generally isn't 4K. Now to combat that slightly, we do have AI upscaling, which historically has been pretty rubbish, but these days, thanks to the more advanced processing in the TVs, uh, it can actually make quite a big difference, but it's still a bit hit or miss. Having said that, if you're on a tighter budget, there's nothing wrong at all with a good 1080p TV. However, I would recommend 4K if possible because, well, firstly, they're a lot cheaper than these to be. You also get all the extra detail in 4K content. Uh, it also comes in handy for gaming, whether you've got a PS4, Xbox One X, or even the next gen console. And also you get HDR, pretty much all 4K TVs sort of come as a bundle, but the two technologies sort of come together, 4K and high dynamic range or HDR. And together they can make a big difference to your picture quality and you don't have to spend a fortune. Pretty decent 4K HDR TVs, say around 40, 42 inches, can set you back, you know, 250, $300 in some cases. They really have come down a lot in price. But then, at the other end of the spectrum, we have these cutting edge 8K TVs. These can look incredible, but they're very expensive, and of course, native 8K content is almost non-existent. Although I do expect that to change over the next couple of years. Also, the actual perceived difference between 4K and 8K is a hard sell too. It's definitely a case of diminishing returns. Plus you'd need a TV at least 65, but ideally 75 or 88 inches to really get the most out of it. Personally, I think 4K is the sweet spot right now. So we've done size, resolution, but now let's talk about panel type. And this is where things get a little bit technical, but bear with me. As of right now, there are two main types, OLED and LED LCD. You might have heard some other names like LG's NanoCell or Samsung's QLED, which are higher quality LED LCDs, usually with a few nice extras. Personally, I think OLED TVs are about the best overall. An OLED screen can turn each pixel on or off individually, so there's no backlight, which means an off pixel is completely black, or very nearly. This means you get an almost infinite contrast ratio. Plus, OLEDs tend to be thinner and lighter, so they work better as a wall-mounted TV. 
downsides, well OLEDs are usually a fair bit more expensive than your usual LCD TV, they also don't get as bright, up to around 7 or 800 nits usually, and they can suffer from some sort of image retention, aka burn-in. Now burn-in does exist, but I've owned I think 3 or 4 LG OLED TVs now and I've never experienced it. But if you are playing the same game for 12 hours a day and it has you know the same HUD elements, or you're just watching the news all day long and it has the same ticker tape, then eventually you may start to see some retention. So if it's in an office or a reception room, maybe OLED isn't a good option, but for you know your usual living room in the house, it's it's absolutely fine. Now Samsung on the other hand have QLED TVs, which are based on traditional LED LCD panels, but with an extra quantum dot layer that boosts brightness, anything from 1000 up to a whopping 4000 nits, depending on the model. And this helps if you're watching in a bright room, and also means HDR content really pops. QLEDs also boast higher color volume, so for example the white sunlight in a scene may be a blinding 2000 nits, but the green leaves on a tree only 1000 and it means that colors on screen can fully reflect what the director and the color editor envisioned. And these Samsung QLED TVs are priced to compete with OLEDs, which come from brands like LG, Sony, and Panasonic. So the OLED versus QLED debate has been going on for years. Everyone has an opinion, everyone has a preference. There really is no right or wrong answer. For me though, in my experience, I think it comes down to either can you get a particularly good deal on an OLED or a QLED, if so go for that one, but really in terms of actual use, if you're watching TV or movies in a dark room or you can control the lighting quite easily, then OLED's going to be your best option. If you've got a bright room with lots of windows, then the extra brightness with QLED is useful. But they're not your only options. LG's nanocell TVs offer an interesting balance. They're more affordable than OLED, and like QLED they're based on LED LCDs, but have an additional nano filter that gives us improved picture quality. Nothing can beat the contrast of an OLED, but the latest nanocells do come pretty close. But taking a step back, and all modern TVs, except OLEDs, use LEDs as a backlight to illuminate the screen, with pricier models using more of them, which is sometimes called full array local dimming. And having more LEDs has a couple of advantages. It means the screen can get brighter overall, and it also allows the TV to dim a smaller area of the screen, which helps contrast when you have a bright part of the image next to a dark area. Which is why the dark or the black areas on conventional TVs with fewer LEDs can often look quite greyish and washed down. And just recently there's a new contender, Mini LED. Mini LEDs are still LED LCDs, but rather than hundreds of LEDs, they use thousands of much smaller ones. This can improve brightness, allows for more even lighting across the screen, and most importantly it improves contrast by allowing finer control over which areas of the screen are bright or dimmed. LG should offer Mini LED at this year's CES, and TCL have just brought out a mid-range Mini LED TV, and while we're not quite at OLED levels of contrast, early reviews suggest it's pretty impressive, so it'll definitely be interesting to see how these develop over the next year or so. Now we could spend all day talking about panel types, but let's move on, and I think the biggest innovation to TVs in the last five years or so is high dynamic range, or HDR. HDR makes the picture look more realistic by having a greater contrast range between the brightest and the darkest parts of the screen, so you can basically see more detail on the shadows and the highlights. And the result is content that can look more immersive and dramatic looking. And a lot of recent console games also support HDR, and you can find HDR shows and movies on all the major streaming services. Pretty much every new movie coming out now supports 4K and HDR. The problem is, there's a couple of competing HDR standards, and most TVs only support one or two. The good news though is that most 4K TVs will likely support at least HDR10. This is the most common type, but how well it's implemented can vary a lot, so it's still worth doing your research about a TV's HDR picture quality. But then there's HDR10+, Plus and also Dolby Vision, which is now known as Dolby Vision IQ. These are better and can dynamically adjust their dynamic range from scene to scene using what's called dynamic metadata. The big deal though is that Samsung TVs support HDR10+, Plus, whereas LG and most other TVs support Dolby Vision. And the truth is there's a lot more Dolby Vision content than there is HDR10+, Plus. and actually that's a big reason why I do tend to stick to LG TVs or another brand that have TVs that support Dolby Vision or Dolby IQ. There's also another form of HDR called HLG or Hybrid Log Gamma, which broadcasters use, but most recent TVs will support this anyway. Now hopefully you're still with me, I know that's a lot to take in so far, but now let's switch gears and talk about gaming. If you're buying a TV with the next generation of consoles or PC graphics cards in mind, then you'll want a TV with a low response time and ideally one that supports HDMI 2.1. Now this does limit you to newer, more expensive models, but HDMI 2.1 supports 4K at 120Hz and even 8K at 60Hz. 
A TV with HDMI 2.1 also gets extra benefits like variable refresh rate. All very technical, but it helps to reduce screen tearing and make your games feel a bit smoother. And you also get Auto Low Latency Mode, or ALLM, which automatically switches your TV to its low lag, low response time gaming preset. That's all very fancy and high end though, and probably out of the uh, price range for most of us. So the most important things for gaming are to get a 4K TV, because then you also get HDR, and then try to get one with a low response time. Anything under 20 milliseconds in game mode is pretty good, and most reviews should give you these figures. While I am boring you to death about HDMI 2.1, another advantage is eARC, or Enhanced Audio Return Channel. The standard ARC connection allows you to send sound to a compatible soundbar or AV receiver, and then you can control the volume with the TV remote, which is pretty handy. But then eARC adds support for uncompressed sound and higher quality Dolby Atmos. But bear in mind, your speaker system will also need to support 2.1. Just a quick word on sound quality, and generally built-in TV speakers aren't very good. They can vary a lot between different brands and also the model you go for, but if you can spare the cash, then a good soundbar will make a world of difference. And finally, pretty much all modern TVs support their usual range of streaming apps, so you know, Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, etc. But higher-end or newer models also get things like Disney Plus and Apple TV. So check before you buy if the TV you're looking at offers the apps that you want. Alternatively, you could get an Amazon Fire Stick or Roku to add streaming apps to older TVs or just to give you more options. A quick word of warning though, because while I definitely do recommend going into an actual store and having a look at a TV because that gives you a good idea of you know, size, design, and even sound quality, the problem with that is store models are put into store mode, which often oversaturates colors, turns on all the processing, and basically makes TVs look artificially good. So they're not always a good representation of actual picture quality. So go into a store, have a look at what you like, but then double check reviews online to make sure you're getting a good TV. And breathe, that was a lot to take in. But if I were to go out and buy a new TV right now, I think for me, I would go with something like the LG C10 series. They've actually just launched the 48 inch model, which I think is a great size. It costs about 1500, uh, although of course, if you do wait maybe six months or to Black Friday, uh, you'll get that even cheaper. But I think that's a really good all round TV. Or alternatively, you could look at LG's now sell options, but these are still on the pricier side. So if your budget is say four to 500 pounds, then there's not much that beats Toshiba's new UK 4B range, which packs in a lot of features for the money. Alternatively, TCL makes some really good value TVs. So hopefully you guys found this helpful and now you know a little bit more about what to look for when buying a TV. And if you did enjoy the video and want to see more from me, then don't forget to hit that little subscribe button down below and also help me get to that 1 million subscriber mark. I'm getting closer and closer. Uh, so if you could help me out, that would be amazing. Thank you so much for watching guys and I'll catch you next time right here on The Tech Chat.